My lab is really interested in understanding how different organisms and animals associate with microbes. So one part of my lab studies some of the really nitty gritty details about how surfaces of different bacteria are recognized by us and other organisms. And then another part of my lab studies this problem in the context of ticks. And the reason that ticks are such great systems for study for us is that ticks have very specific relationships with different microbes. So the pairings are incredibly restricted restricted, which is also part of the reason why they transmit a lot of these to us. And so we're interested in using this to study and also just really to understand um, how they're transmitted and try and get a handle on that biomedical problem. Um, so I'll just preface this by saying two things. One is that one of the best ways to prevent tick-borne diseases is through education. So I really am super happy that you guys are here tonight. Um, second is that I'm supposed to take questions at the end about the substance, but if there are any clarification questions that come up throughout, I would be very happy for you to raise your hand and ask, because I think that's really important for us to make the most of our, out of our time. OK. so. Let's learn a little bit about blood feeding arthropods. So what we see on the screen are things that you probably have encountered in, in your life at some point. We have a mosquito, a sand fly, and a tick. And what these things have in common for us is that they're vectors for disease. So what do I mean by vectors for disease? It means that they naturally have microbes in their bodies normally in their guts, that when they bite us, it passes through them into us, and then they can transmit microbes that are really dangerous to our health. So here's some really classic examples that you might recognize, so the diseases that they cause. Uh, mosquitoes can cause malaria. Uh, sleeping sickness is caused by flies. And then on the right, which is going to be the focus for today, is the black-legged tick, also known as the deer tick, Ixodes scapularis, that causes Lyme disease when it bites you and transmits a bacterium called Borrelia burgdorferi. So I'm going to go through a couple of different topics today. I'm going to start by telling you a lot more about just the biology of ticks and what makes them so good at transmitting pathogens to us. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the challenges that are associated with diagnosing and treating Lyme. I know this is a really hot topic, and it's actually a very complicated topic. So I'm just going to try and give you an overview of some of the challenges. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the strategies that people are thinking about and implementing for blocking tick-borne diseases. And then a little bit more about what else can we learn from ticks just by studying their biology. So I'm going to try and also sprinkle in a little bit of information throughout of research that's happening in the field and in my lab to um, inform you on the, the newest uh, research. OK, so ticks are vectors for a lot of human diseases. So what you see here on the left and in the text are different types of ticks. And there's hundreds of different tick species out there. And these are ones that are most commonly associated with human disease here in the United States. So I have the species named next to each one. You can see they look quite different. And each of them carries a different set of microbes. And that's, as I alluded to earlier, something my lab's really interested in. And these microbes mean that they cause different diseases. And so what you can see here in the red text on the right are the diseases that are caused by each of those different ticks. And so they're categorized based on the ticks that are able to transmit these different uh, pathogens. And so what you can already see here is that there is specificity to this. So one of the first things that you can learn about to help prevent or to understand what you could be infected with is to just understand that it really depends on what tick bit you. If you can take a picture or look up what species it is, it really helps you narrow down the range of microbes you may be infected with. OK. so. Um, what these ticks have in common is that they're known as hard ticks. And this Ixodes scapularis, which causes Lyme disease, is in fact a hard tick. There's also a whole other group of ticks that I'm not going to talk about tonight, but which is worth knowing, which are the soft ticks. And here's an example of one on the right. I actually think they're quite gross looking compared to my favorite tick. But um, there are also some really key biological differences that affect the way they interact with us and what they can transmit to us. Um, the first thing is that the hard ticks on the left have a hard outer shell, so not the most creative name. It's called a scutum. And you can see this uh, kind of dark brown circle. That's what the sputum arrow is pointing to. 
Um, and they also have uh, feeders called, an uh, organ called the capitulum, which is extending out. It kind of looks like this drill at the top of the tick. The soft ticks have one too, but it's hidden a little bit below um, the picture, so you can't see it. So those are some of the major sort of um, uh, physiological differences. And the reason that they have really unique physiology from each other is that they also feed in a really different way. And that's going to matter as we go on in terms of how they um, move their microbes into us. So hard ticks here on the left, uh, the reason that they're hard is they have a really unique outer layer that completely remodels as they engorge and fill up on blood. And they engorge on a lot of blood. So what they do is they take their capitulum and they uh, push their feeder into your skin and they create what's called a pool to suck out blood, kind of like a straw where it's, the blood's pouring into this little pool and they're feeding out of your skin. The soft ticks are different. They feed for shorter periods of time and they puncture your skin and the blood that comes out, they kind of lap it up, which is why I have here a spoon and a bottle to kind of give you a schematic idea of how they're different. And so because the hard ticks on the left feed on you for so long, we call them prolonged blood feeders. They can stay attached in your skin for days to sometimes over a week. So they really take their time to nest and make a home in your body, and that affects the range of microbes they can transmit to you. So ticks are actually quite incredible compared to all the different blood feeding arthropods, mosquitoes, flies, et cetera, in that they can transmit an incredibly diverse set of microbes because they're uh, in your skin for so long. And so I'm going to zoom in on this particular species of uh, hard tick. Um, I, I will say that there's slightly different uh, features of the biology depending on which hard tick, but because we're going to talk a little bit more about Lyme disease today, um, that's what I'm going to focus on. So um, a few basic facts. They have three distinct life stages, larval, nymphal, and adult, and they get bigger with each. And in between each, these ticks need a single blood meal, and so that is critical for them to transition to the next life stage, and it's long. It's about days to a week, depending on, on the context. And so in between each, these blood meals can last for a really long time, and during this period, they can transmit things to you. So what happens in the life stage of the tick is that the larval ticks, they actually don't carry the Lyme disease pathogen. They're what we call naive. And so when they feed on small rodents that are carriers of Borrelia burgdorferi, which is the pathogen, that gets into the gut of the tick, and then they drop off the rodent, and then they molt into the next life stage. And that, that bacterium stays in the gut of the tick across that molt. And it's in the latter life stages that when they bite you, they can transmit it from the gut into the salivary glands and spit it back out into you through their saliva into your bite site. And so that's the normal mode of transmission. And um, it's associated with this classic uh, bullseye rash, but that's not associated with all patients. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, but it has become an increasing public health burden. Cases have more than tripled in the past decade. You've probably been hearing more and more about it in the, in the press. Um, and in the United States proper, it's the most commonly reported vector-borne disease, meaning that it's the most commonly reported thing that gets transmitted through some sort of an arthropod. And so, of course, malaria is a huge problem globally, but within the United States, this is very problematic. So Lyme disease cases are on the rise. Um, and so it's interesting to think more about the biology of the tick and why they're so unique in their ability to transmit this, because maybe that could provide us with clues as to how we can block it, because this pathogen completely relies on the tick for entry and um, spread in your body. And so, as I mentioned at the start of this, tick pathogen relationships are very specific. So what we have here is a map from the CDC showing all the different parts of the United States where there's been confirmed cases of Lyme disease. And so you can see there's a huge clustering over towards the right side of the map. So thank goodness we are on the left side. And I was very happy to see that Hawaii is still as wonderful of a place as you want to believe. Um, and so the reason I want to point this out is that part of the reason that this is so restricted is that the vector tick for this, the species that can carry it, is also geographically restricted to this si that side of the US. 
Um, and you'll note that there were a few cases on the West Coast, and that's for a few reasons. Um, number one, people do travel, which is adding, that globalization is really adding to the ability of ticks to move with people to different places. You know, they don't always necessarily bite you right away. They may hang out for a while, finding that perfect spot to really dig in. And so they can travel with you, and they can definitely travel with pets. Um, the second reason is that we do have a tick out here that can, in theory, transmit the Lyme disease pathogen to us. And that's the what we in our lab think of as a sister tick, which is Ixodes pacificus. It's more commonly known as the Western black-legged tick. And it looks, you know, to a new person, very similar to Ixodes scapularis. Um, so this tick, if we were to take it through lab experiments, it intrinsically can carry and transmit the Lyme pathogen. What makes it special compared to scapularis and why we're uh, somewhat protected from Lyme disease incidents out here is that they have a strongly preferred host of the western fence lizard. You may have seen this in your backyard. They're about this big, um, and they're just all over California. And we don't completely understand why they prefer this so much more than rodents, but if you present them with both, they always go to the lizard. And that's significant because this lizard does not carry Borrelia. There are squirrels out here that do carry it, but because ticks will always go to the lizards as long as they're there, we don't usually, um, we aren't usually at risk for transmission. Um, and so something about the lizard blood is um, antagonistic towards this pathogen. We call it Borrelia cidal because it is able to really clear Borrelia effectively. Um, in fact, there was um, uh, someone at Berkeley who studied this many years ago, Bob Lane, and uh, I have a student in my lab who is also interested in picking this project back up and trying to figure out what it is about this lizard blood that is so Borrelia cidal. So um, I think there could be a lot of interesting lessons coming out from that. So here's just a picture of uh, someone in my group when we went out um, to basically lasso up lizards and you can pull the ticks off of them. And you can see the picture on the right. Um, it looks like almost like a gray pearl earring on the lizard. That is an engorged tick. And so we can find dozens of those at least on the lizards out here, especially in the spring, and you can literally just pull them off. And so one of the things we're doing is pulling them off their natural hosts out here and seeing what kind of microbes are in their guts to try and get a better picture of what's happening in California compared to the East Coast. So in addition to some of the work that my lab is doing on this, I wanted to highlight some work by uh, Nate Nieto. Um, he actually passed away very recently, but he's done some incredibly useful work for our field, and he's been supported by the Bay Area Lyme Foundation, so we're very appreciative of his efforts. Um, he started a project that is still ongoing, and I would highly encourage everyone to let your friends know about it. It's called the Citizen Science Project, and this project aims to look at what ticks people are actually pulling off of them or their pets. So it's kind of a, an a advance beyond just saying, what are the ticks out there, carry, but what are the ticks that we're actually running into carrying? Because that may be slightly different from just a random field study where we're dragging and trying to collect things that are out there. And so what he's done is had people send in from all over the country ticks that they find on them. They send it in, and they've been looking at what's inside of the ticks. Um, and I will say one of the things that was really interesting about this study is they found that um, people with pets are at higher risk for tick-borne diseases. And that's because sometimes pets will track these ticks in, which may or may not bite the pets right away. And so there could be a delay between your activity and when a tick gets on you. And that obviously will put you at more risk if you're not really paying attention um, to when and where you have a tick on you. Um, so a few just highlights from this study that I wanted to point out. Um, so this is, uh, it's in, has been really successful. What this heat map is showing is the number of exodes ticks that have been collected from citizens all over the country. And you can really see the concentration on the East Coast, but we're getting a lot of information also about Exodes pacificus on the West Coast, which is great. Um, has anyone in here gotten a tick on you while out hiking? OK, great. So, well, not great, but they're, they're out there. <laughs> they're out there. Um, 
<laughs> there's a lot of other species too, and I, I want to make sure to recognize them as well because they are not always on our radar. But some of these, for example, Derma Center is known as the American dog tick, so it's really commonly found on pets. Um, but they are also scattered throughout the US. And, and just being very aware, this is all information that's publicly available. Educating yourself on what ticks are in the area that you're in. Even if you're traveling, you could, you know, just check, you know, if you're hiking in a park, what's out there so that you can prepare yourself to pay attention to whether you have a tick on you, what kind it is, and if you have any symptoms, because early detection is really important. Um, and so I also have some uh, zoomed in graphics of the ticks that we found in the Northeast. Um, the majority of them were Ixodes scapularis, but there were many other submissions as well. So this really allowed for um, us to look at the patterns of interactions of humans with ticks. And so that is what my um, next graph is showing, is the submissions across time. So a longitudinal comparison of when people are getting it. And what you can really see is that there's a burst with the seasons. And what that is are the life stages of the tick, really. Um, what you have are uh, larvae, nymphs, and adults. And so the reason I wanted to point this out is that it is important to know um, when they're out, because that is also a risk factor. Um, but it's also important to know that um, larvae are generally naive for Borrelia, so the nymphs and adults are really what you're looking for. And nymphs are the ones that are the most common transmitters of the pathogen, because they're usually out in the summertime or the springtime when you're also out running into their ecology. And also, the adults are just a little bit easier to see and pick off. So the functional outcome of that is that it's typically the nymphs. So we're really interested in thinking about Ixodes scapularis, but also the differences between scapularis and pacificus in terms of thinking about what's happening on the ground in California. And this is just to iterate that the two species, although they have a lot of similarities, their behavior and their biology is also quite different. They feed on different things. The timing of when they're out is different. And even our collection strategies out here on the West Coast are slightly different in terms of where we think we might find them compared to the East Coast. Um, and so these ecological factors, in addition to the intrinsic ability of the ticks to carry and transmit, together are known as vector capacity. And so one area of study in my lab is moving beyond the ecological factors and thinking more about the intrinsic factors, which is called vector competence. And these are principles that apply to not just ticks, but any other vectors that people study. So vector competence means that these ticks have the intrinsic ability to carry, acquire, carry, and transmit all of these different things. And I'll explain what I mean by that in a second. So that means even in the lab, when we can carefully control it, there are some ticks that you can feed them on mice that are clearly infected or even inject the pathogen into them, but they're unable to carry it and transmit it into you through their bite. And so that is something that we're very interested in, is studying each of these different um, points of transmission that are critical uh, for that to happen successfully. So I'm going to walk you through what I mean by all of that, uh, by first walking you through the transmission cycle, which I mentioned to you earlier. So ticks have these three life stages, larval, nymphal, and adults. And the larvae acquire uh, the pathogen through the rodents, which we call reservoir animals, because they serve as a reservoir for the pathogen, that the ticks keep feeding on them in the natural life cycle. That's how it persists in the population of ticks. And so we are actually a dead-end host. It, we are not good hosts for Borrelia, because the likelihood that they can keep on continuing their life cycle through us is poor, because it's symptomatic for us. For the bacterium, it's preferable to continue in the natural life cycle for the rodent, which is asymptomatic, so everybody's actually functioning in total harmony. It's when we enter into their ecology and interrupt that that the bad things happen to us because we have not evolved to um, be hosts for this pathogen. So the nymphs, as I mentioned, will quest and find you. And by the way, they do not fly or jump. That was uh, something that I've had to clarify to a lot of people. But they're really good at finding you. And the way they find you is they do something called questing. So that means that they climb up to the tops of grass or shrubbery, regions where they could easily latch onto an animal walking by. And they literally just 
raise their arms up. In the lab, we have tubes of ticks, and when I open it, they crawl to the top, and they look like they're looking for a hug or something. It's a little bit cute from my perspective. I'm sure nobody else would think that, but. <laughs> Um, but they basically have these like sticky legs that they can latch onto an animal when it's walking by. And they have ways to sense when an animal is walking by through um, temperature, through things in perspiration, um, and, uh, and humidity is also a cue for ticks. And so if they don't sense those things, they're quite still, they're trying to conserve their energy, and then they latch on when an animal walks by. So that happens, and then they find their favorite place to really dig in. And then a few classic things have to happen across space and time for transmission to occur. So the first thing that happens is that ticks burrow in, and they secrete through their saliva these cement-like substances that build a cone, which we call a pool, into your skin. And it goes all the way past the outer layer down into the dermis, where the blood vessels are pouring blood into that, and they're drinking it out of that pool. And so it takes about a day for them to properly build that pool. And then after the blood starts entering, it takes at least about a day, then as the blood enters into the gut, there's a burst of replication, meaning that the bacteria suddenly start to expand their population. And then, after a period of time, the bacteria that are expanding in here are able to move across tissue layers in the, in the tick. They can move out of the tick gut into the salivary glands, which is a completely different organ for the tick. And then that's how they're regurgitated back into your bite site through the saliva. So it really has to happen through the spit. And there's a num a, an amount of time that has to pass before each of these steps can be completed. And so that's one really thing, important thing to remember for the Lyme pathogen, which is that if you've only had, the, even if it's the correct tick, if it's only been attached for the day, for a day, your risk of being infected is very low. Generally, it takes about 36 hours or more for it to happen. Um, the other thing is that I wanted to mention is just that each of these steps is really specific to the vector. So even if a non-vector tick species, which there are some, you know, amblyoma ticks, for example, have been, they found Borrelia in the gut of the ticks, but for whatever reason, Borrelia just doesn't expand its population as effectively in this other tick. And so that's subpar. The other thing that's subpar is that very few, usually no bacteria, can make it all the way into the salivary gland. So if that doesn't happen, these ticks are not like some other arthropods that kind of spit out through their gut, the gut contents. They have to go through the saliva. So if it never makes it into the salivary glands, there's just no way Borrelia will make it into you. And then finally, um, there's inoculation, which means that the ability of it to inject it into your bite site and for that to successfully both survive and then pro move into your body. That is a really key step too, which I'll talk about a little more at the end, but it's a cool phenomenon because what people have seen is that the saliva of the tick is really important for that to happen. It's not just the mechanical delivery because you can actually take a needle and inject Borrelia into skin and your skin is very effective at clearing it. But if you inject it together with saliva that we can take from a tick, it greatly increases the ability of the bacterium to both survive and spread in your body. So these two are working together like a real partnership. And some of that is fairly unique to the tick vector because you can take saliva from other species and the effect is not as strong. So these are like a really magnificent duo at every stage. Um, I guess one other thing I'll mention um, is that there's also something else going on with a tick feeding in the opposite direction, which is that t the Borrelia bacteria doesn't usually just float around in your blood. We don't refer to it as a blood-borne pathogen because it's not always in your blood. It travels through your blood initially, but it actually makes a home in tissues um, that are a little bit further away, usually from where the bite site is. So when the tick's feeding, there's something about that that wakes up the bacteria and causes them to migrate to the bite site. 
And the vector tick species is really good at doing this. We don't exactly know what the signals are. A lot of people in the field are really interested in it. But there's some weird long-range signaling that's happening between the tick and the host that's causing the bacteria to sense it and come. And it's dramatic sometimes where in the lab, if we feed um, non-competent tick species on a mouse, they really won't get very many of the bacteria to the bite site. But if we feed both the vector, this tick, and the non-vector ticks on the same mouse, everybody gets more. And that's because there's something about this species that allows more Borrelia to travel. And so we think it's really cool that, uh, well, you know, it's unfortunate that this happens, but it's really interesting to think about how this happens so uniquely with this particular tick. And one of the things my lab and other groups really want to understand is what are the molecules that are involved in allowing this to happen? Or maybe conversely, what are the molecules in the other tick species that are preventing this from happening? If we can figure some of those mechanisms out, that might be a handle for us to try and block this since it's so reliant on the tick vector. OK, so I wanted to briefly talk about some of the challenges associated with diagnosing Lyme. This is one of the most you know, problematic aspects of the disease is being able to accurately and quickly diagnose patients who have been exposed to Lyme pathogen. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about why that is. Um, and so here again is Borrelia burgdorferi. And I had mentioned earlier that the bite of the tick carrying um, Borrelia can often lead to this bullseye rash, which everybody has probably seen at some point or heard about. The problem with that is a couple things. Um, if a tick bites you, let's say, in your hair, which happens a lot, ticks are quite good at going to places that you're not paying attention to, or your back, you may not see it right away, or you may not see it at all. The second thing is this doesn't happen for all patients. It happens to about half of the patients. So that means if you don't have this, you may assume that everything is fine. You may never even notice the tick. And then you're just living your life like normal. The symptoms that can arise from Lyme disease are also really um, diverse. Um, and some of them can be associated with many other diseases. So arthritis, fatigue, and these can um, sometimes ultimately lead to neurodegeneration and be fatal. But it takes a really long time. So you can imagine, you know, I actually have started having some knee and back problems uh, in my mid-30s. So I wouldn't necessarily think that I had had a tick infect me with this. It may take a really long time for me to realize that there's something wrong. And it may also take a long time for these symptoms to come up because ticks can incubate for a really long time before they really start to um, proliferate in your body. And so the other thing that I mentioned earlier was that they move through your blood, but they ultimately reside in tissues, some of which are very immune privileged. And so there's a limited window for treatment because they're not just in your blood where we can give normal drugs to people like antibiotics um, that are often very effective for microbes that are in your blood, for, for sepsis and whatnot. But this is a little bit harder to get enough drugs to the right place to be effective. And so the longer you wait between when you're infected and when you treat, the less likely it is going to be that the antibiotics are effective. So this is a really problematic aspect um, of Lyme disease. And it's also just very difficult to detect. Um, even if it is in your blood, the levels are quite low. Um, and so it's, there's a lot of interest in trying to figure out if there's a way to, rather than looking at the, the cells that are actually in your blood, your body's response to this pathogen as a signature that could read out that you might be infected with it. So there are a lot of people working on different aspects of this. Some of the uh, diagnostic tools out there are exactly this, looking at your immune reaction to that. Um, Charles Chu is an investigator here at UCSF who's been looking into new technology, sequencing-based technologies, to also find a readout for this for Lyme disease. Um, you might know that there's a vaccine for dogs, but there's not currently a vaccine for humans. Um, I'll mention this a little bit later when we talk about strategies for blocking, but there was a vaccine that had been taken pretty far through uh, the process of getting approved, and then ultimately it failed um, before it uh, fully went to market. So it's, there's currently no direct way to treat Lyme disease specifically. Another 
challenge with tick-borne diseases that's beyond Lyme is that ticks can carry more than one microbe. So I had shown you that list at the very beginning of all the different diseases they can transmit. That doesn't mean that a single tick can only transmit one. Sometimes a single Exodus scapularis tick can transmit multiple things. And so from that same study I showed you from Nate earlier, they looked at the incidence of co-infections, and they did see examples of this, of it carrying multiple pathogens. And these are really just pathogens that we already know about, although we think there could be others that we haven't even discovered. So this is kind of a candidate approach, but it's suggesting that it can infect with more than one. So you can just imagine that this could really throw you off. For some of these, they're overlapping symptoms, and so Lyme is the most common commonly known one, you might be completely focused on Lyme when you could have something else or something else exacerbating um, the Lyme pathogen infection. And so that's all adding to the challenges associated with this. And so I'm going to talk about this more in a second, but there's more interest now in also trying to block the tick itself rather than just trying to go for specific pathogens. Like if you could take out the delivery service, you might be able to take out all of the things it's delivering. And so I'm going to go through this for a bit. Um, so there was a vaccine that came out. Um, and I wanted to put up this article that was in Nature Medicine in 2014. I don't have a ton of time today to go through this in great detail, but it's a really interesting and a not very long read. I highly encourage everyone to look it up and give it a, give it a read. But it talks through a lot of the sort of political, logistic, and technical challenges associated with getting this vaccine um, through the pipeline. One of which was, um, it has in quotes here, the yuppie vaccine. So when they were developing this vaccine, as they talk about in the article, there was this uh, criticism that this Lyme disease was really a disease that only afflicted the privileged. It was the privileged people who were going on these hikes in New England that were getting it, that this shouldn't be you know, a major focus of biomedical efforts. And so that was one thing kind of, that kind of poorly branded the whole thing. And so that was an obstacle. But then there are also other technical obstacles that um, they talk about more in the article. But ultimately, that really was a big setback for the field because there was this vaccine that showed some efficacy, but a lot of researchers were kind of discouraged by uh, the outcome of this process. Um, but you know, I, I think that the researchers, researchers are still definitely sticking with it, and there's hope ahead that there's a lot of groups that are trying to figure out new ways to do this. Um, one of the new ways uh, is called paratransgenesis. So this is talking about controlling something about the biology of the vector rather than going after the actual microbe. And typically, it's by engineering other microbes that are associated with um, the vector that could negatively affect the ability of the vector to carry the pathogen. I'll explain what I mean by that through an example. So this is Aedes aegypti, which is the mosquito that can transmit Zika. Uh, mosquitoes can also transmit a number of other things, dengue, chikungunya, yellow fever. Um, but mosquitoes, as do many other insects, have this what we call a symbiont, meaning it's a microbe that's always associated with the insect. It has some sort of partnership of itself with the insect. And the symbiont is a bacterium called Wolbachia. It's very pervasive. And what researchers found is that certain kinds of Wolbachia that are associated with insects, if the insect has it, is unable to transmit some of the pathogens. So then they cleverly thought, well, if we could just engineer the mosquitoes to have this and spread it through the population, we might find a way to actually block their ability to be a vector. So that's the idea behind paratransgenesis. And this has actually shown some early success in mosquitoes. They've done a number of uh, releases of mosquitoes that are infected with this bacterium, which, by the way, has no detrimental effect for us. Um, and uh, there's been some success coming through the pipeline for this work, so I'd encourage you to read more about it. In fact, there was a release in California a few years ago, ago through a project called Debug Fresno. So this is an active area of research if you hadn't heard about it already. 
And so um, my group and others are very interested in whether there's the potential to do something like that in ticks as well. So over the last few years, there's been really a, um, an outpouring of reports looking at all the different microbes that are naturally associated with ticks, trying to identify things that n may negatively correlate and potentially block the Lyme pathogen. And so I just wanted to show you a few snapshots of the actual tick gut that my labs looked at um, as a representative data set of looking at the microbes in ticks. Here is the, the tick gut. Uh, you can see the epithelial cells, which are basically the layer lining the tick gut. And then in the middle is the lumen of the gut. So this is a cross section through its gut. And the blue is staining all the different tick cells. And then in magenta are uh, ways for us to stain the actual bacterium that causes Lyme disease. It has this kind of corkscrew-like shape to it, squiggling along the lining of this. And then here it is overlaid. You can, in, in black and white, you can really see it popping. It's kind of just like snaking around the lining of the tick gut, waiting to go out with the blood meal um, coming in. And so what we can do is also visualize other bacteria. What you can see in this one is there's not that many other bacteria that are present besides this particular one. Um, but some of the tick guts, we see something very different, which is that we see these tiny little dots here. And you can zoom in. And this is a stain specifically for bacteria, where you can see kind of rod-shaped and circular-shaped bacteria that seem to be residing in the tick gut. And notably, we don't see Borrelia in this tick. So my lab and others are starting to go through these individual species and see if in the lab-controlled experiments we can replicate some of these patterns and block Borrelia transmission by the tick. And there's many other groups working on this as well. Um, so in addition to this, there's another strategy that's coming to the fore in the field, which is uh, taking a page from the playbook that uh, people for the, in the sandfly field and mosquito field have taken as well which is thinking about the biology of the tick, the saliva is really important for the tick to finish its blood meal. And so if you can block saliva or something in it that's critical for the tick, you may also be able to block the successful movement of the pathogen through the tick. And so there's this vaccine in sandflies that's a vaccine against not a microbe, but against the sandfly saliva protein. And that, in turn, blocks the ability of the sandfly to transmit what causes leash mania. And so this has been a really exciting new development in that field. And more and more people are interested in looking at what all is going on in tick saliva as well. And ticks are incredibly dependent on their saliva for their feeding. Um, we happen to think that tick saliva is the coolest of all the blood feeding saliva because they feed for so long. Um, so that is another area that we're starting to move more into, both my lab and other labs in the field. This is starting to go through and study the biology of tick saliva. In tick saliva, there's hundreds of proteins compared to the dozens or less that are in mosquitoes and sandflies, and that's because they feed for so much longer. And so ticks are really master regulators of us. And so what I'm showing you here, if it doesn't gross you out too much, is the tick that's actually in the middle of its blood meal. And you can really see it is like diving all the way in. This is not a passing interaction. And so has anyone had one on them and not even realized it? OK. It's the creepiest feeling in the world. At least it was for me the first time I found a tick on me, because it's just in your dermis, and you don't even realize it. And that's because ticks are very, very adept at shutting down your ability to detect them. So their saliva does all kinds of things when they bite into you. And you can just imagine for a tick, because they have this one single blood meal to transition between their life stages, it's so critical that when they decide to feed, that it goes well. And so everything is geared towards this happening successfully. So here's just a cartoon schematic. They break through your skin, and they form this cone-like cement layer. The blood vessels pour in. So if we think about this, a lot of different things have to happen for this to work out OK for the tick. Number one, when they break into your bite site, it's possible that some of the microbes around on your skin could infect the bite site. And so that could cause rashing or swelling, just like any time you have a cut and it gets infected. So it has a lot of antibacterials in its own saliva that somehow Borrelia is able to evade. But these antibacterials help to keep that bite site clean. The other thing is that it blocks your ability to heal. 
So they have things that prevent platelet aggregation or clotting, so the blood can really flow freely into this site without incidence. In fact, there's things that promote active blood flow. It also has the ability, because your skin, even if you didn't have an infection, obviously if you scratch it, we've all had a bump come up. It prevents that from happening, so it prevents inflammation, so it has anti-immunity things that shut down your kind of local alarm system so that everything is peaceful there. Um, and then the other thing is that they have incredible molecules that block itch and pain. You don't feel it. And so one of the things we're really interested in is can we follow these different things and ask what is critical for the pathogen to transmit? Because you can imagine all of these things could really help. If you're a pathogen that's trying to slip through the detection of the host, if all these things are shut down, you really have an advantage in that process. So number one is understanding what's important for the pathogen. And then number two is, could we just learn something about skin physiology and itch and pain by following these different molecules? We kind of think of them as probes that we can go, just crumbs that are left behind to see how the tick has hacked into our system. Because clearly the tick has evolved to do this so effectively. It probably understands aspects of our own body that we don't even understand yet. So we're trying to hitch a ride just like Borrelia by understanding what the tick is doing to block all of those. Um, so I think I already mentioned all these points. Um, yeah, and I, I just want to emphasize um, how much saliva there is that's secreted. Over 90% of the blood meal is condensed, uh, the fluid of the blood meal is pushed back out. So what it's doing is actually condensing down the blood proteins um, in its meal, and then the water goes back out, which is what the saliva is made of. So you can cut a fed tick in half. I don't know if anyone's done that. OK, just me. <laughs> if you cut it in half, it's a little more like a jelly kind of consistency, rather than I was expecting, I was ready for like a water balloon popping effect. Uh, so I had on like my goggles and prepared for it. But it's actually more of a gel-like substance, because most of the water comes back out. So that gives ticks a lot of food for sustenance over potentially a long period of time. I think there's ticks that have been documented to be out in the wild for years and have been able to survive that. And so they can take in a lot of blood meal. In fact, I mean, they really take in so much that in some cases, they can grow 500 times their weight through a single blood meal, which is wild, if you can imagine. Try and imagine that scaling yourself. Um, and so here's a picture of some ticks that we have in the lab. Uh, what we have here on the left is a um, nymph. And it's kind of the size of, um, I don't know, like a, a large, coarse black pepper. And after it feeds, this is what we call engorge when it's completely done feeding and falls off. Uh, and it looks like this. And so it stays about the same kind of um, length, width, size, and eventually molts into this lovely female adult. And then this engorges into this, which is about the size of a peanut kernel. And so they are really regulating us in order to complete this cycle. So I just wanted to, I know it's gross, but hopefully you'll remember it and think about tick saliva and, uh, and this concept of saliva activated transmission. The question, in the engorged tick, is there any uh, Borrelia burgdorferi left in there? Yeah, so the question is in the engorged tick, is there any Borrelia uh, burgdorferi left in there? And yes, there is, yeah. There, not all of Borrelia makes it into the salivary glands. It can subsist across a molt. And that's also something that's really different between the non-vector species and exodes, is that um, the non-vector species are good at clearing it, and it doesn't usually survive a transstadial molt. Um, so yeah, they can continue to be carriers across more than one life stage, the nymph and adult. Um, and so one of the things that we're doing towards this effort to identify salivary molecules of importance is to start really collecting tick spit and looking at what's happening in the tick spit over time in terms of what molecules are there. And I think you, you may have noticed that I mentioned a lot of different phases that are happening during feeding. There's sort of the bite building phase, there's the slow feeding, and then they really ramp it up and start fast feeding, and then they detach. Um, and 
saliva changes in its composition across each of those different phases to help accommodate those changing needs of the tick. And so we're starting to collect saliva from different points. Um, and I just wanted to show you kind of how we do that. What we see here is a partially engorged tick that we've pulled off the mouse. And we've literally just used scotch tape and taped it down in the lab. A lot of what we do is just kind of trying to figure out how to do things for the first time. So yeah, scotch tape, glamorous scotch tape. Uh, and then we broke this um, thin glass capillary needle or tube. And you basically push it onto the feeding organ of the tick and capillary action will pull the water of it out, which is the saliva. And there's um, a chemical that called pilocarpine that will induce the tick to salivate even more. And we leave them in this little box overnight with this. And I don't know if you can see from there, but it's the saliva is pulled out all the way to here. And so we can collect saliva from ticks at different time points and use um, tools to characterize the different proteins that are in it, look at how that changes over time, and we're systematically going through to see uh, what these different proteins are doing. And then what's down the line is seeing if we can block it through experiments where we develop antibodies against them, whether that could also block transmission of the pathogen. Um, okay, so I think I mentioned those as well. There's many more proteins in the saliva of the tick, um, and so that is probably also why they're such good vectors um, and very dangerous for us. Um, so that concludes the uh, different topics I wanted to survey. I wanted to leave plenty of time for questions because I'm sure there's questions. Uh, so I'll go ahead and open it up if you have anything you'd like to ask that we can talk about more. Yeah, absolutely. So um, the gentleman asked um, the other activities in the saliva, like antibacterials and anti-itch, et cetera. Um, yes, there's a lot of interest in that. Um, one, uh, one group of people that I, I didn't anticipate but makes total sense are uh, people in the catheter industry. Because um, uh, catheters, one of the challenges with catheters is they have to remain in you for a, an extended period of time, just like the tick, and they can get infected. Um, there can be you know, weird reactions that are happening around it because it's a mechanical wound. And so they're very interested in some of the, those exact properties in tick saliva that could be used. Um, we are, in my lab, are currently studying uh, an antibacterial enzyme, looking at all the different bacteria it blocks, and it's really effective, so we're excited to figure out how that could potentially be used. Um, and then we're also working with a lab. I think there are many labs who are starting to partner with other labs, like dermatology labs or um, itch and pain labs. We have uh, Alan Bosbaum here. He's, his group studies itch, and we started looking at the ability of tick saliva to block mouse itch. So what they do is this really cool experiment where they can take mice and video their scratching behavior in response to some provoking with histamine or some other um, something else. And then they can record bouts of scratching. And what we see is if we prime the mice with tick saliva, we see a reduction in that scratching. And other groups have seen similar phenomena in the past. So we're starting to really mine if there's anything in there that can be used, because there's very few um, options out there for itch and pain. Yeah, you know, D isn't that effective against ticks. Um, it's, that's really more geared towards mosquitoes, flying insects. Um, clothing is probably the best external measure you could do. I mean, I know when my group goes out to actually collect ticks and we're really going out into the battlefield, what we'll do is we'll wear light clothing, long sleeves and long pants so that you can actually see, but checking each other for it is really important. Um, but sometimes, you know, they just slip through. So we would always take, we always take like hot showers soon after. That can deter a lot of the attachment. Um, and then just paying attention after. It's challenging. They're determined to attach. Oh, OK. So she's asking if Borrelia is positively confirmed in your blood. What does that mean if you're asymptomatic? I mean, it means you're infected. And you should probably take antibiotics uh, to clear the infection. It means that you could develop symptoms later. Um, so I would take that seriously, even if you don't have symptoms yet. Lyme disease is sort of notoriously known for having delayed onset of symptoms. 
Yeah, I think that's a really frustrating aspect of the disease for patients. Um, it's hard for me to put a number on that. And um, I think what we, I can only tell you what we know, which is that patients are clearly suffering. They have something. And there's at least two possibilities. One is that it's in them, but it's d hard to detect. The other is that it could be something else. And so a negative answer is the worst answer, especially for a test that's bad. So it's that absence of facts and knowledge that's contributing to a lot of the, maybe what you see that seems sort of inaccurate or overblown out in the press. But I think what we, we know is that at least whatever people are suffering from isn't overblown. But we don't know exactly what's going on. It's probably different in every case. And the concern about infections with other pathogens is also very concerning. It could be that even if someone has Lyme pathogen, it's unclear if there could be another pathogen there that's really making it worse. Or Yeah, so it's a, it's a challenging. Uh, field. Yeah, so yeah, we can grow them in the lab, but you're absolutely right. He's asking if you can sort of promote culturing of this bug in the lab by giving it saliva. Um, so uh, we have had a lot of challenges growing it, but what people have done is not saliva, but try to mimic things that are happening in the blood. So the media we use, which is actually really expensive because we have to supplement it with all kinds of stuff that you might find in the blood. We have to add gelatin to make it a little more viscous. I mean, it's such a diva. We feel like we have to do everything, play the right music, have the right attitude to just like make sure every, every uh, time it'll grow. But yeah, that's currently the technology is to try and mimic the blood-like environment. But it does beg the question, you know, um, the, we study Borrelian culture in this specific culture, but it cycles between totally different environments. The tick, the human, blood, tissues, even within the tick, the salivary glands in the gut are so different. So there is a push in the field to try and figure out if there's ways to study it in these more natural environments because it clearly can adapt and have a totally different physiology as it's moving throughout. So some of the culturing methods could be biasing us towards a specific condition. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really um, good point. So there is an antibody response to, um, well, there's an antibody response to some things in the tick as well, but there's also an antibody response to some of the, the proteins that decorate the surface of the bacterium. So that's classically what's been looked at and also what the vaccine was developed against. Um, it has a lot of different proteins on its surface and that, that coat of proteins kind of changes also while it cycles between the different hosts. So that's been a very active area of study. What Charles Chu is doing is um, looking even more broadly than that. Um, uh, that was sort of more of a candidate approach, but he's looking, just sequencing the entire response. And um, I think he would have to tell you more about what they're finding there. Yeah, that's a great question. That really hits at the heart of some of the challenges. So she asked whether the symptoms that you have in response to the pathogen are your immune system overreacting to something and um, going into disarray, or if it's the actual pathogen doing something. And I think the answer to that is it's likely a combination of both to varying degrees depending on the patient and the case. Um, but that is an active area of study for sure, just seeing if it's like accidentally over-activated some aspect of the immune system that, you know, one thought in the field by some is that even if Borrelia has been cleared, sort of the scars of that on your immune system are still at play, and could that be contributing to some of the long-term effects? Um, but it's not totally clear. It's a, that's a really hard one to ask. It's not like, a, you know, another pathogen where you can very clearly say, like what the contribution is. Uh, yes, definitely. Um, so she asked uh, another sort of knob we can turn on is um, blocking the reservoir animals that are the original source of the bacterium. And so there, there are definitely groups, especially on the East Coast, who are thinking about this, how they can play around the, with the ecology of the actual animals that the ticks feed on. Um, I think there was an article about it in the New Yorker a few years ago, this guy out on the East Coast who's trying to play around with the animal population, um, I think near Long Island. I, I'm not totally sure if I'm getting that right. but. 
Yeah, and and then I I think there were even efforts at one point of um, trying to deal do, deal with some of the deer. I, I'm not sure if they ever did this, but it was one of the ideas of of trying to control the deer population uh, by suggesting that um, deer hunters on the East Coast try and focus their hunting efforts to deer near residential areas. But you can imagine encouraging hunting near residents is maybe not the most strategic um, way to go about it. But if you're just focused on the ticks, you may not realize that at first. Um, so yeah, there's been a number of discussions around that too. I mean, I ultimately think that there's not going to be a single silver bullet that probably it's a combination of everything from education, ecology, you know, uh, to medicines. So she's asking, um, what are the risks associated with city-dwelling ticks um, and their hosts that are uh, more in the city limits? Um, so I think one of the problems is that we are moving into forested regions more and more, right? So that's one of the things that's contributing to the expansion of Lyme disease is that areas that were previously forested and not occupied by humans were moving into. And it's that collision of those ecolog ecological systems that's causing this problem. So I think that's just one part of the answer is some regions on the East Coast in particular, when you see more, more people moving, expanding that perimeter of what city you see more of that. Um, but there are other things, you know, um, in the city. Um, tularemia is um, a less common disease that's caused by ticks, but it's caused by ticks that feed on rabbits. It's also known as the lawnmower's disease. I, you mentioning the lawnmower made me remember that. Um, but it can be transmitted both through the tick and through um, breathing of this bacterium that's carried by rabbits. And so there's been cases where people mowed over a rabbit or something and, and were infected with this. Um, but ticks can carry that, for example, as well. So there, there are other things out there besides just Lyme disease, especially here on the West Coast. And we're start, I think that that's one of the reasons the citizen science project is so important, because we can start getting some of that granular information about what people are running into in urban areas or in um, forested areas. Um, yeah, sure, it is. And because climate change is going to affect the animal population. And so if you have an expansion, the animal population, we're seeing an uptick in ticks. We're seeing an uptick. Yeah. <laughs> um, there was a, I, I had a, a few years ago, I can't remember how many years, it goes by so fast. Um, but you know, example of this was that there was like an acorn bloom on the East Coast, which turned into a rodent bloom in response, which turned into a tick bloom later. And so there can be a lot of sort of trickle down effects from global warming. It's wild. I, I mean, I, I only started doing, I've been doing this for a couple of years, but what I've been hearing from a lot of people is that they're seeing more and more ticks, people who have lived here for a really long time. Right now, we're really focused on China Camp State Park. Um, we did a bunch of kind of small surveys here and there. There's actually a, a somewhere near Monterey called Garapata State Park, which is Spanish for tick. Um, so not surprising that we found stuff there. Um, but the reason we decided on China Camp is people are running into ticks a lot. And they're running into ticks that a small percentage are infected with Borrelia. Um, the other reason we thought it would be useful to focus in and do a longitudinal study in one region is that the, that area could correlate with a lot of clinical data from Marin General. And so we're hoping to see if we can identify things in the ticks, but also have sort of a reference point to cross-reference and see you know, if we're finding things that people are actually getting infected with. So that's where we are right now. But there's, I mean, there's way more than just my group looking at this. Um, we're a small piece of that puzzle. Um, there's a lot of different agencies that are tracking different areas. Uh, you could easily look up some of these agencies and see what they're monitoring. Yeah. OK, great. Thank you so much.